All right, well, let's, uh, let's step into the Word. We're going to start in a story in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Mark uh, 9, verse 14, uh, page 1,457, and uh, we're going to jump right into that. Um, I recognize uh, that we're having a special Sunday, so um, we're going to, uh, if you guys would just uh, give uh, your time to the Lord here. Uh, I know we're about to end, so um, if I could just get five more minutes, if everybody's cool with five more minutes, just five more minutes. Okay, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Okay, we'll have you out of here by 12:30 noon. Pastor Jim said that would be good. And um, no, we're gonna, we're meeting with the Lord today. Amen. We got time for the Lord, right? We got time for the Lord. No one's going anywhere. Don says it's raining. No one's going anywhere. All right. So Mark 9, 14. Let's take a look at this. Uh, I'm going to read the story, and then we're going we're gonna to talk about it for a little bit. Um, mine's titled, The Healing of a Boy with an Unclean Spirit. Um, some say a boy healed. Um, it's just a beautiful story in the gospel. Here we go. When he came to the other disciples... Uh, Let's pause there for a second. Side note, Jesus is coming off the Mount of Transfiguration. If we backed it up a couple verses, he just had his transfiguration. He's being counseled and ministered to by Moses and Elijah. Um, They're encouraging him in the suffering that he's about to endure, um, just giving him courage and speaking to him. And uh, John and James and Peter are there. It's such a mystical, insane spiritual thing that Peter doesn't know what to do. And he's like, let's build temples up here. So it's like a wild, like crazy thing that happened. God spoke from heaven, like this is real, right? And God said, this is my son, Uh, listen to him. And uh, they're coming down off the mountain. So that's where we pick it up. All right, so context matters. They're coming down off the mountain. When When they came to the other disciples, he saw a great crowd around them and the scribes disputing with them. So the disciples and the scribes, these are the experts of the religious day, are having a dispute together. And Jesus steps into this dispute. Immediately, all the people saw him And they were greatly amazed, and they ran to him, and they greeted him. He asked the scribes, what are you debating with them? And one of the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and whenever it takes hold of him, it dashes him to the ground. Uh, Some versions say it it breaks him, it it throws him to the ground. So this uh, version we're reading this morning says it dashes him to the ground to the ground. He foams at the mouth, he gnashes with his teeth, and he becomes rigid. And I told your disciples so that they would cast it out, but they could not. He answered, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him, and when he had saw him, immediately the spirit dashed him. So the spirit did the thing that the father said happens to his son right in front of Jesus. And he fell on the ground, and he wallowed, foaming at the mouth. He asked his father, how long Has he been like this? Since how long has it been since it came to him? So, like you know, Jesus is asking the Father, "How long have you been living with this? When did this spirit first come upon uh, your son?" And the Father responds to Jesus. He says, "From childhood, often it throws him into the fire, into the water to try and kill him." Uh, In Matthew, uh, the story is recorded in Matthew, Luke, and Mark. And in Matthew, it says at this point in the recollection of Matthew, it says sometimes the spirit departs him when he bruises himself, okay? So we'll add that detail in there. And then he says, um, uh, you know, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people had come running together, he rebuked this evil spirit, this foul spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, some versions say, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. The spirit cried out and convulsed the boy greatly, but it came out of him, and he was as dead, so that many who were watching said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast this out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting. So this is the story that we're going to look at, and I believe we're going to see some amazing gospel truth um, come out of this story. I want to speak to you guys out of this story because I want to tell you who you are. I want to tell you, grace and peace, that you're contending for a spiritual legacy on the earth right now. 
that we are in a moment as the American church contending for the faith. We are contending, will the next generation, will our children and our children's children walk in the faith that we walk in or that we walk with the God that we've experienced. We're contending for that spiritual legacy to be passed on from one generation to another generation. Grace and Peace is not a club. You're, you didn't sign up to be a part of a club on freehold, old Freehold Road, road right? This, this isn't a club that we serve and, you know, have different, like, you know, hangouts and barbecues. We are a part of a, a, a group. We are a part of a company uh, of the saints. We're a part of the church, and the church is here. Uh, you know, Scripture says that um, the kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. In other words, the kingdom of God, there's an energy that comes against the kingdom of God, but those of the kingdom fight back with an energy, fight back with a power, and take the earth by force. They, they take the kingdom by force. And so I'm here to tell you guys that you're living in a world where you're contending for the promises and the legacy that is over your life, over your family, over your children and your grandchildren. I love the song that's become so popular in the days of, of COVID where we say, you know, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And we've been singing that prayer. And from a generation, a thousand generations, we're contending for spiritual legacy. And that's amazing. That's, a, that's the promise. That's what's happening. But some bad news is things aren't looking good. Things aren't looking like we're winning in that contending war. And we don't have to even look to the news to figure that out. You can actually look more inward at your own life. You can look more inward at your own family. You can look more inward at the people you love and watch that. Man, like in some ways it feels like darkness is winning over light right now. And, you know, it, it, like, in some ways, it, it looks like things couldn't be any worse. You know, maybe things are going to get worse. We don't know. Like, God forbid. Like, but, you know, but what, what, what's our place going to be? What are we going to do in this moment? How are we going to live every day? Well, this story motivates me. This story gives me energy to face what we're facing right now because what I see in this story is I see like this secret message from 2,000 years ago that's saying right now this is what I'm doing. Right now I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever and I see God saying this is what I'm doing. This is what I want to do. This is what I've always been doing. This is what I'm going to do. And even if it doesn't look like it right now, here's my plan and I'm looking for you to cooperate, you know, to come into obedience with the will of God and participate and partner with what I'm trying to do right now. That gives me great hope when we see a sliver of hope in a dark day, right? How many of you know the, the light shines bright when it's dark? And when I look at this, this story, it lights me up. It lights me up in a dark day. Um, Gabby and I have been in, you know, youth ministry for several, several years, and uh, we feel like um, that, that wasn't just a preparatory um, season. It wasn't just a stepping stone. We didn't treat it like a stepping stone to become a senior pastor. Or, or, uh, uh, we, we, we adopted the next generation. We said, th this is, these are our people. You know, we're, we're walking with this generation. We're contending for this generation. And as we were doing that, we were, what we were seeing in young people is we were seeing our own brokenness. As we were ministering and trying to help and serve young people, we were seeing our own rebellion, we were seeing our own brokenness, we were seeing our own sin, our own areas where we weren't fully submitted to the Lord, our own doubts, our own unbelief. We, we, were, we were seeing ourselves in young people and, and we were seeing the brokenness in the world and it brought us to a place of desperation where we're like, it's, what, what, how, how can you put a dent in this? How can you change this? How can, how can, what, what, what's it going to take for something to change in a young person's life or something to change in this girl's life or this guy's life? And it, it brought us as pastors to a, a, a level of desperation. I'm a reader, so I would just read and try and get as many tools as I could, as try and get as many things. And that, I think that's excellent, and that's what we need to do as leaders, as parents. We need tools. We can't it's not good enough. I'm gonna, we're going to stand before Jesus, and we can't just say, well, you know, we didn't know how to do this thing, God. You know, we can't, we can't have excuses. We have to, Paul, um, Peter says you have to be prepared without an excuse. You, we have to have the tools. So we pursued tools, but we realized tools wasn't good enough. 
Tools wasn't enough. Tools could only go so far because at the end of the day, tools didn't help me break through someone's glazed over eyes. Tools didn't help me reach into somebody's heart and awaken something inside of them. Tools didn't help me help someone else get free from anxiety or depression. Tools didn't help me walk through a pornography addiction with a young person. I needed something beyond tools. Tools is... we. we you, what I needed was I needed the breakthrough power of God, and then the tools rehabilitate us after we get the breakthrough. Tools alone don't work. It's, it's the, the breakthrough power of God. And what happened is we were at this conference, and we were listening to Joseph Garlington, and he was preaching about Elijah and Elisha, and he, and he talked about owning a gen- He talked about mentorship and discipleship, and he, he said this phrase. He said, you know, you can be the father of a generation if you weep for it. You can adopt a demonically possessed generation if you will get on your knees and pray and weep and ask Jesus to deliver it. And he was referencing this story, the story of the father who brings his epileptic son to Jesus. And this wrecked us. I remember it was before we had kids, me and Gabby were at the altar and we were just just weeping and this thing just came over us and we just, because we were feeling the pain of what young people are going through in our day. And it's not new pain. It's not, it's the same pain that that, that you guys went through in the 60s. It's the same pain that our great grand right? It's like, it's the same thing that it's the, it's the condition of humanity. And when we just, we just said, Jesus, you got to break through in this. You got to break through. And so months later, um, we were pregnant with Corey and uh, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and I knew I had to read the story. That's crazy because we got this prophetic word. It wasn't for us personally. It was just him teaching, you know? And um, I wrote it in my journal but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until several months later that I really started to study this. And the Lord woke me up, and I began studying this. And I, I want to share with you, uh, with the minutes that we have, just w- what I'm seeing here in Mark 9. And, and so what we see is, uh, we see Jesus coming in at the right time. Jesus comes in at the right time, right? Jesus comes in off the mountain at the right time, and he steps into this situation, and this situation can't be solved by the disciples. They, they, they couldn't cast this demon out of, out of the sun, so they began arguing. They, I'm wondering if they started talking about what's the strategy? Your strategy versus my strategy, right? The experts were saying, well, the disciples do church like this. And then the scribes are saying, but we're supposed to do church like this. And if we did it like this, then the sun would get cast out if we did it like this. And if the carpets looked like this, then the spirit would come out of the sun. If the music was like this, then, and you can just see them arguing, right? And Jesus walks down into the situation, and I love it. He just walks in at the right time. They're all amazed, and Jesus asks a question. He's like, how long did this happen? Like, how long has this been happening? And the father says, since childhood, which to me means this isn't a boy, right? Scripture says a boy healed, but he says this has been happening since childhood. I wouldn't say something was happening since you were five years old if it was, you know, an eight-year-old. I wouldn't say since childhood. They're still in childhood, right? And so you can almost imagine this ancient family in this ancient world, like having to take care of a a, a young adult son, right? Like you could imagine him somewhere in his like 15 to 30 year old range. And this father, this, this, he can't talk. He's convulsing. He's getting thrown in the fire. He's having epileptic seizures. He's schizophrenic, like all this. So this, this now is the burden on the family as a young adult, right? Like where he should be now kind of moving into adulthood. And now it's this burden on the father. And he, and he says to Jesus, since childhood, childhood. And guys, that's, that's our story, right? I mean, my story is that, like, something happened when I was a child. Something snuck in when I was a child. Something, something got a hold of me when I was a child. That's what scripture says. It, it got a hold of him, and it, it breaketh him into a million pieces. I was living a life, and this, this energy, this wind, this spirit that had a hold of me was breaking my life into a million pieces. It was causing me to do things I didn't want to do. I couldn't do the things I wanted to do. I had no control over myself. I was dealing with anxiety, shame of sin, and all this stuff. And I, this enemy was breaking me into a thousand pieces. And I, I see so much of our stories start in childhood. You know why? Because the enemy doesn't play fair. I hate to say that because it doesn't seem fair. And I hate when things aren't just. But that's just how it is, that the enemy doesn't wait to go man to man with an adult. He takes a seven-year-old. He takes a five-year-old. He said, I'm going to start twisting your life up right now. 
And that's what we've been born into. And we can shake our fists at God and say, that's not fair, that's not right. Or, or, or why, why such a vulnerable life? Or, or why do the innocent, why does this have to happen? And we can, we can shake our fist or we can start to say, well, God, how do we live in the midst of this vulnerable life? How do we live in the midst of the suffering? And so, so he comes to this, this moment and he, he explains the boy, he says, he foams at the mouth. And I just get this picture of like, just like, oh, like rage, like anger, rage. And just, it just wells up into foam. And it's just like, I imagine myself as a kid, just like shaking my fist at God. Like, I hate you, God. And I'm gonna set my life against you. And I don't wanna be a part of my family's church. I don't wanna be a part of this or that or whatever. And I just get this rage, like this, this foaming of the mouth. And then it says that he gnashes his teeth. And we actually know, like, the gnashing of teeth has to do with anxiety. That, like, you can, you can be so, you know, nervous or your mind can be so racing that you don't realize that you've been grinding your teeth or you've been gnashing your teeth. And, then, you know, I, I don't know about you. I've experienced, like, that in my life. Like, just anxiety. And when you look at young people, you're seeing them just dealing with this stuff and the weight of this stuff and just... And it's not just young people. I, I, we've ministered this message, and I've had, I've had men come up to me and say, you know what, I, I, like the anger, God's melting the anger away as you're preaching this message, Mark. And I was an un, there was an unhealed boy inside of me because it doesn't matter if we're adults, we can still live with the baggage and carry that, that wounded kid with us our whole lives. Doesn't matter our age. You can be young and super mature. I've seen I've seen 19 year olds with spiritual maturity, and just uh, and you can be 60 and still be a 14 year old inside emotionally and spiritually, right? And so 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 God, like, this, this this is for all of us. I want you to find yourself in here. And then it says he becomes rigid. Like this, I love this language because it's like, if my parents tried to get me to do something, like you know how much I dug in on that thing? It was just like, I get rigid. And we get like that with God, right? We know God is asking us to do something and we kind of plant in and we get kind of immovable. We get rigid and just like, if you're, you know, Don had to come move me right now and I just held, he'd have to like lift me up and move me, right? Like I'm rigid and immovable. And this is the, the language that the father is explaining the, about the son and you can just feel the anguish in the soul of the father. He's like, I just want to have right relationship with my children. I just want to be connected to my son, but he's mute. He won't talk to me. He won't say anything to me. And Jesus just continues to, to minister and, and, and he says like, listen, if you got faith, we're going to do this thing. You know what I mean? Like this is where the, the hope and the good news comes in. And so the father, it continues to go on. And I love this language. The father says, if you can do anything, help us. I love that help us. Because when I read that help us, you know what I realized that means? That's help us. That, this is our problem, guys. The father makes the son's condition his issue. He's saying, this is, I'm not just leaving this for my son to figure out. I'm saying this is our problem. Guys, I'm telling you, the problem, it's our problem in America right now. The church, it's our problem. We got to own this together. We got to say, this is, help us, God. Don't help them, God. There's, you know what happens when you start to use that kind of letter? Help them. That means they're different than me. Help them, God. No, this is help us. God, we need help. Have mercy and compassion on us because the condition of our kids and our kids' kids, that's our condition. We, God, we need, we need you. We need, and this is different than the, the Syrophoenician mom, right? She says, have mercy on me. And that's a beautiful story, but I just like the comparison of it, right? It's like the father really is saying, like, this is our condition, I love that. He doesn't just pass the buck to the next generation. He doesn't kick the debt of one generation of sinful debt to the next generation, right? He's saying, I'm going to deal with the bloodline. I'm going to deal with it. Like, help us, God, right? And so, so, so then um, he says, help us. And then Jesus says, or what he also says in there is he doesn't say just help us. He says, if you can. I love that language too. If you can. What does that tell us? If you can. The father's questioning what? Can, what's can? Ability. He's questioning the ability of Jesus to deliver and heal his son. The leper questioned what? He says, if you are willing. The leper doesn't, he gives, the leper goes, if you are willing, you can heal me. 
And so the leper is questioning the willingness of God to heal leprosy, to, to, to heal someone who's cast out of the community. The father's questioning, do you have the power to deliver my son from this demonic oppression? And why is he questioning that? Because the disciples couldn't do it. Because the church wasn't delivering his son, he was questioning Jesus' ability to do what the church could not do. How many of us, subtly, I, I, listen, I know I'm preaching the choir because you're here at church, but how many of us start living in a way where we start subtly questioning the ability of God to show up in our families because we're looking around at what the church is doing or what's happening in our families or this, that. I'm telling you, Second Peter says that God is not slack in his promises like we consider slow. God is not slow in his promises. Whatever promise you're holding on to, he's not late on his promise. He's not taking his time on his promise. It says he's patient so that he can deliver and save everybody. God's about saving our households. He's not, this isn't an individual relationship with God. This is a spiritual legacy of families and families connected together to the family of God. That's what it is all about. It wasn't just saving Abraham. It was saying, Abraham, I'm going to be a good to you and your whole lineage, your whole legacy. I want to talk to you, your loved ones right now. God is after them right now. Your, God is after your loved ones right now. And if we can get a hold of this story... So, so listen, listen, this is, what, this is what jacks me up about this thing. When you dive into what this, what this kid was dealing with, and you start to like look at what is catalytic um, schizophrenia, which is like the, what the Greek was of what he said epilepsy was. It's like not exactly epilepsy. And you start to look at these, these, these symptoms, and it's like what this guy was dealing with I mean, not, we're not 100% for sure, but the language, if you study what the language is, it, 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 it gives you ideas of like, this, this guy was dealing with being emotionally worn out, uh, a, a weak mind, like there was corrosion of the mind, or disorganized speech, he was unable to express himself. Just imagine the son. He disorganized behavior, he's uncontrollable, his conduct was uncontrollable. Delusions, that's the belief in a contradictory reality. Hallucinations, that's the fantasy to the, to the extreme where you're, you're uh, visually and auditor like audio, like you're, you're hearing, you're hearing things that aren't really happening, you're seeing things that aren't really, that aren't really happening. There's a lack of motivation, a, 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 a disconnect from social engagement. And when I read these things, I just think of like, think of all, just think of our generation, right? Just think of people, how our, our minds are being worn out, how we're emotionally worn out, how we're disconnected from reality, where some of us are living in, within fantasy worlds and, and, and disconnected from uh, reality and can't express ourselves or maybe don't have control over our bodies. And what I see in this is I see that 2,000 years ago, Jesus healed a millennial. 2,000 years ago, Jesus healed a Gen Zer. Because, like, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, this boy was the condition of the next generation, of every generation. And Jesus walks down off the mountain, and he heals this boy. And that, to me, is hope, and that's hope for us. That there's good news, guys, that today Jesus answers the questions that we have for 2022. How is he going to do it? He's going to come down off the mountain, and he's going to step into your loved one's life. He's going to encounter them in a radical way with power and with the ability that I can ability the Messiah ability to heal and restore the situation into the way that it's supposed to be. And this is, this is what happened to me. And I'm not trying to make theology out of me. I'm, I'm telling you, this, what I see in the story and what I experience, I'm trying to be a witness to the truth to you right now that this is what God is capable of doing. And I want to stretch your faith even farther for your kids and your loved ones. Because if your goal is to get them to sit next to you at church, that's not the vision that Jesus has in his heart for your loved ones. We think of it like, oh, if you could just hear this sermon, or if they didn't play that song at worship, or if you could just sit next to me, or whatever. I'm telling you, what's, what God wants to do in our families and in our loved ones is so transformational that people will say that your kids are like dead, that they changed so much, that the old self died so much, and that there's some new person living outside of them, because that's what happened. Jesus delivers this boy, and they say he's dead. It's over, and he brings them up, and they're like, no, it was like he was dead. It was like he went through 
he, it's like he went through the resurrection of Jesus and came out another man. I'm telling you, th this is the level of transformation that we are about to see in the kingdom of God. We are going to see this. So how does that happen? Well, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, listen, it, it only happens when I come back off the mountain. No. He says this only happens through prayer and fasting. Friends, I want to tell you, we got, we got to play the long game right now. We got to play the holy, radical, long game. We got to stick with it day in and day out. We got to be praying and fasting. We got we to gotta move through this life with godly fear, with perseverance, with, with righteousness and holy. We got to go to war against sin in our own lives. We got to get less concerned with, the, with the, the, the speck in our children's lives and our children's children's lives and our coworkers' lives and more concerned with the plank in our life and start living a radical, holy life. And God says, when, when, when we step into that, then this will come out then this will this deliverance will happen and I, I love this and, and we'll bring it to a close and, and we'll pray together but I love this the father says that it's a mute a mute spirit the father says it's a mute spirit but Jesus calls it a deaf and dumb spirit and what the father wanted was for the son to speak and what Jesus knew is that the son needed to hear and this is what we need in our day, is we need to hear the voice of God, and we need to, that's deafness, and we need to perceive the presence of God. That's dumbness. Dumbness isn't how you do on a test. Dumbness is like, are you aware of what's going on? Did you just run into the curb? Are you dumb? It's like you didn't see that curb. It's perception. It's awareness. And so what Jesus is doing in us and doing in the people we love is he wants to bring out the spirit that's causing transmission issues to hear God speak. He wants to bring out whatever is distracting our perception of the spirit of God in our lives and the spirit. And, and when that happens, when we hear God and we know God's with us, then our tongue is loose and we'll respond with what Romans 8 says, when the spirit himself comes and bears witness with our spirit, that we respond by crying out, Abba, Father. My, my tongue got dealt with when I started to hear God and sense God with me. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like that, that, that's what happens. I love that so much. I, I, and I love this other picture in this story too. Of in, in 1 John 3, 8, remember what the father said. He said that the spirit, this evil spirit breaketh or, or cracketh or teareth my son in the, in the old Bible version, right? Well, there's another word that in the New Testament where the, right, the apostles use that, and it's in 1 John 3, 8. And it goes like this. It says, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. But for this purpose, the Son of God appeared and was to destroy the works of the devil. Some versions say the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The same destroy word that the Father used to talk about how the evil spirit was wrecking his son is the word that the Apostle Paul uses to say why Jesus came and what he was going to do to deal with the devil. You guys catching me? And so what we see here is we see a war between light and darkness. And just because on a daily basis we might see like, like darkness is winning, I'm telling you, our job is to step into the world and to bring light. And there is a battle raging and waging, and God wins. The, the light wins over darkness. And the Son of Man was made manifest on the earth to destroy the works of the devil, and he wants to destroy the thing that's destroying you are destroying your children. That's what, that's what Jesus is all about. And that's what he's doing. And so I want to ask you guys, just as, as we close, to just stand with me. Because grace and peace, I know that you have loved ones that you're believing for. It's beyond just our own family. It's, it's God's family. It's, it's co-workers. It's, it's people who have left the church. You know, you walk with God long enough, you see families walk away, come back, all that. I'm telling you guys, we are on the verge. I'm, this is, I'm saying this as I get on an airplane to leave America, and that doesn't make sense to me, but we are on the verge of an American revival. I'm telling you, there's, 
There is a whole generation of people that are alive on the earth that don't know what Brownsville is. They don't know what Toronto is. They don't know what the charismatic renewal is. They don't know the Jesus people. They don't know the manifest presence of God invading a people on the earth. And I'm telling you, God will only wait so long. He's about legacy. And if he, he's going to mark a generation. He's not going to leave a generation to not be marked. But he's trying to get a hold of the parents. He's trying to get a hold of the moms and dads, whether literally or spiritually, that are saying, I'm going to stand in the gap because I'm going to bring the generation to Jesus. That kid didn't come to Jesus himself. It took someone to bring him to the bottom of the mountain. And we as the people of God, through intercession, we can bring a generation to Jesus. And I believe Jesus will come off the mountain and we will have a radical manifestation, a, a, a habitation of God in America again. All the conditions are right for it. Jesus, right now, we just pray. Just come on, house of prayer, church. Let's just step into this with me. God, we, we pray right now that you would come in a mighty rushing wind. You'd come in a wave. God, come. Jesus, if you can, come and have compassions. We know you can. We declare that the power of Jesus is able to. God, we're, we're, we're contending for loved ones. We're contending for family members. God, we're contending for spouses, Lord. We're contending for friends who've walked away from the faith. God, we pray for a great move. Come on, church. Let's press into this. We pray for a great move, Lord, in our day. Jesus, we thank you for the hope of this story, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you stepped down 2,000 years ago off Mount Tabor into this child's life, into this kid's life. You're going to step down right now into America. God, we pray for Tom's River. We pray for New Jersey. We pray for the nation, God. Would you flood the nation, God? We pray for a wave of revival in Jesus' name. God, we need your help. Strategy won't do it anymore, although we need strategy. Ideas of man won't do it anymore, although we need the mind of Christ. God, we're praying for revival in Jesus' name. I prophesy even over grace and peace that you have been contending for spiritual revival and legacy in this house. Gabby and Nate, I prophesy over you right now that the season of prophecy is coming over your house right now. That the spirit of prophecy is coming. That dry bones will be awakened. I prophesy right now, Nate, that it wasn't just some skit, but your voice will speak to dry bones and you will awaken an army in Ocean County. Pastor Jim, I prophesy that, oh, that grace and peace will disciple this county. That you will be a discipler of this county. That this... This church will be a place of encounter in the spirit. That the spirit of prophecy has been welcomed, will be welcomed, and has always been welcomed in this house. God, we thank you. We thank you for the move of God and the blessing over this house. Jesus, we love you. We honor you. Father, we are expecting fully loved ones to come home. God, we're praying right now for encounters. Listen, listen, church. We might want to get them in the, in, in the pews, but God can get them anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Like, my sister's here from, from St. Louis, and I, in 2006, I was in a car. I wasn't, listen, I was hung over when Pastor Walt used to preach on Sundays. You know what I'm saying? It's like that kind of thing. I, I you know, I got impartation, the fear of God, I, all of that happened here. But God encountered me. In, in a Chevy Blazer in 2006, 400 miles away from my home church. You're, God can reach our family, our loved ones. He can encounter people anywhere. And what we're praying for is the Jesus that steps off the mountain to encounter our loved ones. And it's possible and it's happening. We love you guys so much. Gabby and I love you.